Welcome to the webinar, Principles of Facilitation, Keeping Your Start on Track. My name is Heather Blanton. I am the National SART Program Coordinator with the Sexual Violence Justice Institute at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Preparation of this material was supported by the Office on Violence Against Women, U.S. Department of Justice. The opinions, findings, and conclusions expressed are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. Department of Justice. MINCASA is a statewide coalition driving transformative culture change to address sexual violence through advocacy, prevention, racial justice, and systems change. We envision a world free of sexual violence in which all human beings are treated with dignity and respect and communities are transformed through safety, healing, and partnerships. We carry out our vision through the work that we do. We provide leadership and resources to advocates in providing services to all victims and survivors in their communities. We work to prevent harm and address root causes of sexual violence using an anti-oppression lens. We work towards a Minnesota where BIPOC survivors have access to safety, affirmation, and systems they can trust and use. We invest in community-focused work alongside our efforts to transform systems, prioritizing underserved communities. The Sexual Violence Justice Institute also known as SVJI, is a national program operating within the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. SVJI creates long-term sustainable systems responses to sexual violence that meets the specific needs of each community. We also have a few different values that we use to guide the work that we do. And those are collaboration, integrity, courageous and bold action, work to prevent harm and creating social change. A little bit about what we can offer. Some of you may have previously attended one of our webinars, workshops, or virtual conferences, but we also provide training on special topics about sexual assault response teams. We also have a wide variety of resources available, such as toolkits, templates, fact sheets, which are all available on our website, which I will make sure to list at the end of this webinar. We provide support. Sometimes this is also referred to as technical assistance. This is where we can assist you with brainstorming issues, assistance with meeting facilitation, and problem solving around a variety of issues. Essentially, any problem that you are experiencing regarding your sexual assault response team, please reach out to us for assistance. We can also assist with connections. So if there is an issue that you bring to us that we are not able to provide assistance on, we will make sure and get you connected to the right people, such as experts or other technical assistance providers. We also help to get you connected to your peers or mentors. Mincasa hosts a connection call once a month that will pick back up in February of 2023 that is open to all SART teams nationwide. It's a great way to get connected to folks who are doing the same work and to bounce ideas off of each other, so be on the lookout for that. In the summer of 2022, Mincasa hosted the first annual Leadership Cohort for Sexual Assault Response Team Coordinators. This course was uniquely designed and tailored to the emerging needs of SART coordinators around the country. The virtual training was comprised of four modules that were spread out into four four-hour long sessions over the course of four weeks. The collaborative partners for the development of this curriculum were Futures Without Violence, the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence, the YWCA of Flint, Michigan, PAVSA in Duluth, Minnesota, the Hope Coalition of Red Wing in Minnesota, as well as Mincasa staff. We will be hosting annual leadership cohorts once a year for the next three years as well. More information about the leadership cohort will be available on our website in 2023. One of the areas of particular interest and areas where most folks identify needing more information and training was that of meeting facilitation. Some coordinators were finding difficulty in keeping the team engaged virtually. Others were struggling to keep the momentum of teams going in the virtual space. So we wanted to bring more information on meeting facilitation to you today. 
A lot of the course material was taken from the virtual meeting facilitation basics module of the leadership cohort training. In this webinar, we will be reflecting on personal facilitation style, individual strengths, and areas for improvement. We will look at how to use templates of agendas, meeting minutes, schedules, and other key documents for starts and adapt them for your own purpose. We will also look at how we can utilize time management and facilitation tools intended to support start coordinators to be effective leaders. Take a few minutes and jot down some thoughts on the following questions. First, think about experiences with meetings that left you feeling frustrated, unheard, bored, angry, distressed, burnt out or confused. How could effective facilitation of that meeting change your experience? Secondly, I would like you to think about experiences that you've had with great meeting facilitators. What characteristics did they demonstrate? What was the group dynamic? How did you feel when you left those meetings? How did the meetings impact your work outside of them? Keep the answers to these questions in your mind as we walk through the rest of this presentation. Before we talk about who a facilitator is or what their responsibilities are, I wanna make a note about what they are not. Sometimes people associate hosting and facilitating meetings as the same thing. However, there is a difference. Hosts typically set the agenda, although in some cases, the facilitator may also have that role. Hosts usually start the meeting and ask questions that keep the, the meeting moving. Facilitating a meeting entails driving consensus, efficiency, and inclusivity for the team. Facilitators are responsible for ensuring that everyone can participate in the meeting and any decision-making that takes place. In addition, a facilitator uses knowledge of group processes to formulate and deliver needed structure for meeting interactions to be effective. This includes following the agenda, oftentimes timekeeping, creating time for questions and discussion, recognizing when the group needs an unplanned break, and guiding open discussions towards action steps and a decision when necessary. Facilitators are always balancing process, relationships, and results. Facilitation is just as much about the process and the relationships as it is about the intended results. How members feel about their involvement and contribution to the SART impacts the overall group dynamics, commitment, and sense of shared purpose. Skilled facilitators address the underlying group dynamics when possible and engage in challenging conversations when conflicts between members surface. Facilitators are also facilitating decision-making processes, but they're not necessarily the decider. They are also ensuring members of the group feel heard and that conflict is addressed. Effective facilitation requires an eye towards equity whose voices are privileged in the room and who is being silenced. A facilitator needs to have a baseline understanding of these dynamics and not shy away from bringing them to the forefront. This does not have to be confrontational and can be done in simple ways, like asking the group which perspectives are missing and how the group can address it. A facilitator is a person who also has relevant content knowledge, this can and probably should be knowledge relevant to SART processes, but equally important can be content knowledge related to group dynamics, systems level thinking, and trauma-informed care. Facilitators are accessible, attentive, and empathetic listeners. They're flexible, but direct and with boundaries. This role requires some creative problem solving and staying attuned to the needs of the group which often means finding a balance between sticking to a rigid agenda and endless discussion on a single topic. It also requires the ability to be direct and engage in challenging conversations. Facilitators are also actively involved, but sometimes invisible in the process. To expand on the example of challenging conversations, effective facilitators often ask the group to expand and reflect on open-ended questions that can get to the center of the issue without inserting their personal opinion as fact. As a SART leader, you will be representing your respective organization. So it's not about neutrality, 
as much as it is about actively giving everyone the space and time to be heard. As a SAR coordinator, it is quite likely that most of you are taking on multiple roles that could be delegated to others. Think about the typical roles people play, especially during virtual meetings. For example, think about who on your team is the facilitator or co-facilitator. Do you have a designated presenter or does your team take turns presenting? Do you bring outside presenters in? Who is designated with creating the agenda for each meeting? Do you have someone who provides tech support during virtual meetings? Does the presenter screen share or is that a role that the tech support takes on? Who is the note taker or chat box monitor? Does your team have a vibe checker, someone who keeps tabs on the overall atmosphere? Is everyone getting a chance to participate? Is anyone shutting down or is there a conflict brewing? Because there are so many roles and different moving parts all being juggled at one time, particularly in the virtual meeting environment, it may be helpful to discuss sharing roles amongst team members, which we will talk a little more about in a few slides. As an example, let's talk about how we handle role sharing here at Mencasa. We typically break up the roles into three categories, presenter, facilitator, discussion monitor, and tech support. Presenters typically present and facilitate their own slides, discussions, and activities. Typically, the presenter also oversees running their own slides. Discussion monitors check in attendees, answer questions in the chat, make sure the facilitator or the presenter sees the chat, comments, and questions. They may also provide presenter time warnings as well as serve as backup for tech support as needed. Tech support is running the tech, such as launching the polls or breakout rooms. They may be putting links in the chat, such as any handouts or materials, evaluations, for example. They may also respond to emails if people can't access the Zoom or if folks are needing help troubleshooting audio or video issues. I share all of this to say it's okay to ask for help. You can assign roles at the beginning of each meeting or establish a system for rotating roles, like recording the minutes with an established template. I do also wanna note that some SART meeting minutes might be subject to the Freedom of Information Act. This varies state by state, and it is recommended that your SART is clear on whether your notes could be requested. Consider which roles require input from the SART. So for example, you may want feedback on creating agendas, ideas for potential presenters, or suggestions for new member outreach, for example. Sharing role, roles contributes to shared leadership and a shared responsibility for outcomes. This includes subcommittees. Subcommittees are no different. You can still create that shared responsibility and leadership on a smaller scale. Everyone has a role to play. Although it may typically be the SART coordinator or the SART chairperson's role to ensure the meeting minutes are covered, distributing the responsibility among members generates shared responsibility and engagement during meetings. This also really helps promote that idea of shared leadership. I will include a list of helpful resources and handouts at the end of the presentation, but there is a great SART meeting minute template from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center that can help get you started. Every SART needs to have a mission and vision which provides strategic direction for the team, much like a North Star in the sky. Your team mission and vision also defines the purpose of the team and instills a sense of belonging and identity to the team members. This in turn can also help motivate them to work harder in order to achieve success and collaboration. The mission statement provides the team with a clear and effective guide for making decisions while the vision statement ensures that all the decisions made are properly aligned with what the team hopes to achieve. So I would like you to think about whether your team has a written vision and mission statement. If so, do you regularly revisit them and do they guide the work that you do? Or do they need some updating? Sometimes the team's focus will change over time. So thinking about whether the vision and mission statement still serves the purpose of the team will be important. Because both of these documents are considered living documents, they are really meant to lead the team in the work that you do every day and ensure the vision and mission are still aligned with team values. 
When we think about our vision statement, we want to think about where our SART is going. It is future focused, meant to inspire, and really looks at the long term change that the SART wants to work towards. Vision statements illustrate where the SART aspires to be. It provides a perspective of the impact a SART will have as well. These statements are typically short in length, usually one sentence, but really answer the question what is the long term change? that will be realized because of this SART. Where is this SART going? So for example, the vision statement of the New Mexico SANE task force is to have those affected by sexual violence receive consistent and quality medical treatment and forensic service from providers who meet the fundamental qualifications and training in the state of New Mexico. So as I mentioned before, vision statements are future-based so you are contemplating where your start will be five to 10 years in the future. It really speaks to the future work of the team. The focus is on what success will look like. You also wanna make sure that you use simple, clear language and ensure the statement is not too long. You wanna be specific and avoid organizational or discipline specific terminology or jargon. We wanna make sure that there is a shared language so that everyone is on the same page. You also wanna make sure to align the statement with the values the agency have agreed upon for the SAR as well. Mission statements on the other hand, succinctly explain the purpose of the SAR in less than a paragraph. They declare what the SAR does, how it is accomplished, name the community groups and people that will be served and what value the SAR provides. Mission statements are intended for the members of a SART and the community it serves. If you don't already have a mission and vision statement, we do have a few tips for developing them. The mission statement is really all about the purpose of the SART. It's present focused, so what the team wants to do today. It talks about SART jurisdiction, who will be served, including the SART's values. Mission statements really provide answers to why an organization exists. They also offer framework, structure, and direction for the SART and define the purpose of the team. In addition, mission statements are short. Typically, they're only one to two sentences long. At the core, mission statements seek to understand the question, what is going to be done? Who will be served? And why does this organization exist? So for example, the ABC County Sexual Assault Response Team increases access to specialized services and support and improves the multidisciplinary response for victims of sexual assault. It's important to have a vision and mission statement because this increases the understanding of role clarification. It improves member and community engagement and also reduces team conflict. When we are in a disagreement about the ways in which we can move forward on a particular decision, we can look back to the mission statement and identify which direction is most in line with our SART's mission. It also serves as a North Star when developing meeting agendas, which we will get into in the next couple of slides. Mincasa has a mission and vision building, builder resource that I will make sure to list at the end of this webinar, but this resource can really help your team work on strengthening your own mission statement. I'd like for us to take a moment and think about how many of you have had meetings in your schedule that could have been an email, should probably be canceled, but are not at least half of the time, or tend to end with no resolution or direction moving forward. It's extremely common to participate in meetings that seem to happen just because it's regularly scheduled. So does every SART meeting that you coordinate have a purpose and clear outcomes that advance you towards the greater goal of the SART? It's important to think about how you stay focused on your North Star in every meeting as well. The most important and first phase of every successful meeting is determining a purpose and an agenda. It's okay if you're new to your role in SART or you haven't practiced clearly outlining the purpose of each meeting in the past, because that's what this training is intended to support you with. I'd like to take some time to go over the fabulous POP model. The POP model disciplines us to have more action with less motion, less activity, but more results. So you'll see on this slide that successful meetings have a purpose, 
an outcome, and a process. Let's take a look at purpose first. Our work should always begin with a purpose, right? Purpose helps us understand why we are doing what we are doing. And that is where our team's SART mission statement comes into play. What is your SART mission statement? How does this meeting align with advancing your mission and goals? As SART coordinators, sometimes it can feel like there's always more to do than can be done. So before embarking on any significant expenditure of time and energy for the team, we want to ask why. For what reason? This could pertain to almost anything we consider doing with our team, and it's extremely important because we want to value everyone's time and effort. This also helps to ensure that our energy is being spent on things that matter. So here we have another example of a sample SART mission statement. The purpose of the Via Christi Regional Medical Center Wichita vicinity Sane SART program is to facilitate a community-based collaborative response to all victims of sexual assault by providing immediate and follow-up medical advocacy and criminal justice services in an ethical, in compassionate manner. This mission statement explains the purpose of the SART, lays out how it will go about executing the purpose while keeping the statement short and to the point. The meeting topic for a monthly SART meeting serves as the purpose of that specific meeting. However, it should always tie back to the mission statement to keep the meetings grounded and working towards your established common goal. Some SARTs have co-chairs who assist in deciding the meeting topics for each meeting. Some SARTs assess the team by taking a poll for meeting topics, particularly if there's not any sort of big project that is currently being worked on or discussed. So if we think back to the sample mission statement on the previous slide, we can speculate that one meeting topic could be coordinated response and assessing what this currently looks like in your community. This SART may also want to cover evaluation of service provision, right? Particularly if part of our mission is to ensure that services are being offered in an ethical and compassionate manner, for example. We could even do a community needs assessment to assess the current state of services by asking those who are experiencing the services. Were follow-up services immediate, ethical, and compassionate? Once our purpose is clear, we want to then define the specific outcomes we seek to accomplish. This is the what, how, who, and when. Outcomes are different from a goal. They are concrete, clear, and help everyone be in the same conversation at the same time. What are the specific results we want to achieve that will help us fulfill the purpose? Outcomes are specific and measurable. They provide problem solving and a commitment to action with a deadline. They can include things that are visible, concrete, and easy to measure. Usually they are nouns, not verbs. So for example, a list, a plan, a decision, an agreement, knowledge of. Following this sample mission statement, part of what we say our team will do is develop collaborative response. One initial outline <clears throat> for this outcome could be, by the end of this meeting, we will have a working list of local service providers we can reach out to in order to incorporate them into our referral network. Or another example could be, by the end of this meeting, we will have a plan for future collaborative response in this SART that respects survivor confidentiality and ensures services are provided in an ethical and compassionate manner. We want to make sure we do not move on to the next step in the POP process until we are completely clear on the outcomes we want to create. Let's take a few minutes to write out one to two desired outcomes for your next SART meeting. If you do not have an agenda for the next SART meeting yet, you can choose a new topic that you would like to eventually address in your SART and write one to two desired outcomes for that. Again, make sure the outcomes are visible and easy to measure, focusing on using those nouns, not verbs. The next step in the POP model is process. How many of us have rushed from one meeting to the next without having carefully thought out the purpose and outcomes of the next meeting or how best to structure that meeting? 
In the context of SART meetings, the process is the final agenda and the facilitation strategies that you use. The purpose and the outcome should always be included in the agenda at the top of the meeting. I would also recommend adding the SART mission statement to every agenda as your North Star and always making sure there is time at the beginning and the end of the meeting for people to connect and either open or close without feeling rushed or halted in the process. Particularly in the virtual meeting space, we sometimes lose out on the time to connect with each other outside of the scheduled meeting time. A lot of that connection used to happen organically before or after meetings or sometimes during parking lot conversations. So thinking through some potential options we can offer to team members to reinforce that connection and networking time. Maybe this means letting folks know you will open the Zoom meeting 15 minutes before the meeting time if folks would like to jump on early. They can use this time to have free flowing conversation or talk about items that may not necessarily be on the meeting agenda. It is also important to recognize the process phase is also the time to bring out your facilitation skills. Like we discussed earlier, the agenda is important, but the process requires being flexible and adapting to the needs of the group. Sometimes there is more to a discussion than you might have anticipated, and it's important to take the time to give the needed space and time to adequately discuss options, ideas, limitations, and barriers. Now that we have an agenda outline with clear outcomes, let's pay attention to the amount of time it actually takes to cover a topic and consider whether we need to make some adjustments. Understanding the stages of discussion will help your team process in a more streamlined way and work to be more effective in decision making. Think about the following questions. Where do your start meetings tend to spend the most amount of time? Where do you need to spend more time? Facilitators usually start a discussion in a broader, more generative space where you really get a lot of good ideas, opinions, and information. The problem is that sometimes this phase never ends, which makes it hard to narrow down the ideas in order to move forward. The folks at the Interaction Institute for Social Change created this model as a way to talk about the stages of discussion. In the open stage, this is where you're clearly defining the meeting purpose. This is when the meeting facilitator is opening up the conversation to all the ideas, opinions, and information to consider. All ideas are welcome and good, so we are not analyzing what someone has said at this point. In the narrow phase, we begin focusing ideas into parts and work to organize and clarify the information for better understanding of the outcomes. And then at close phase, this is where we reach agreement on course of action. This could involve possible scenarios as well. So if we look at this graphic, you'll notice the largest section is open. And this really correlates to all of the information coming in during this phase. Narrow, it gets smaller, and closing is even smaller than that. So when you think about facilitation and the amount of time to get through these phases, it really is reversed from the size of each piece of this model. So even though the open phase is the largest in this model, you may not need as much time to have brainstorming sessions. You typically will need more time to narrow and close it with a decision on how to move forward. So as a facilitator, this is important to think about when developing an agenda. You may need to spend more time in certain areas of this model, depending on where your team is at in this process. I do also want to note that this, this model is scalable, so you might decide to spend 30 minutes on open discussion, 10 minutes to narrow, and five minutes to close out with a decision, or you might need to spend an entire meeting in the open phase and then narrow and close at the following meetings. Each team will be different, so do what works best for your team. Let's take a little deeper of a look at each phase of this model. In the open phase, you are stating the purpose. So for example, we are here to decide how to proceed forward with X, Y, and Z. You are looking for any statement that will get the discussion started. You may want to provide the team an idea of how you would like to proceed from here, such as let's come up with three or four potential actions that 
will achieve the X, Y, Z goal or some sort of idea that will set forth the course of action for the meeting. You will then want to encourage brainstorming ideas. You're creating a wide opening for creativity and information to pour in. You're making lists and listening to each other, making proposals for ideas. You may also want to set guidelines such as all ideas are okay in order to encourage everyone to participate. You will also want to spend time clarifying with the team so that everyone understands and is clear about what each idea entails or means, especially before moving into the next step of evaluation. In the narrow phase, you are working to condense redundant points, get a sense of the group's priorities, and eliminate ideas based on feasibility, relevance, allowability, and alignment with overall goals and intended outcomes. So for example, you may suggest, can we combine X and Y as they are very similar? Can we eliminate this point here? Because I see a similar point further down on the list. You are working to eliminate redundancy and cleaning up or condensing the ideas. You may now also want to suggest prioritizing ideas. So for example, let's each choose our top five and see where that takes us. Letting the group see where others' priorities are without having made the final decision yet can also help narrow down and eliminate choices as well. We will then want to evaluate the choices that are left. Asking the group if anyone feels particularly strongly about a certain option can help raise awareness of the details in a choice and also uncover strengths and weaknesses as well. In the close phase, you are working to close this discussion by refining proposals and agreeing as a group how to move forward. Depending upon where the team is at in this particular agreement phase, there may be small suggestions that can be made, such as combining two elements of ideas to help reach an agreement or adding to a potential idea to make it more feasible. You will also want to make sure to check in with the team at various intervals to check for understanding and agreement, or if there is a potential stalemate. If you are at a stalemate, asking the group how they would like to proceed. In some cases, if you are deciding between two options, you may suggest asking if it is possible to try both ideas. This could avoid a win-lose or either-or decision by the team as well. We have covered the stages of discussion, but just as important is an understanding of adult learning theory. Understanding how adults learn can also help streamline the discussion process. So we're gonna switch gears right now and focus on some of the relational aspects of SART facilitation. For our final portion, we're gonna do a brief overview of adult learning theory, specifically experiential learning theory. Then we're gonna work, think through some of the roles of discomfort in the learning process and how we can balance discomfort as a strategy for learning with and creating a trauma-informed and necessary space. To start, experiential learning theory believes, one, learning is a process, not an outcome. This is an ongoing lifelong process of learning. Two, all learning is relearning. Relearning is another useful habit. It involves going back to an older practice when you need to and using your existing skills to boost your learning. Beyond just learning new things, which is clearly a huge process, we also have to practice letting go of outdated ideas and practices and coming back to the skills we used to have. Three, conflict, differences, and disagreement drive the learning process. The ability to understand the conflict and disagreement will determine your reaction and how constructive is the role you take. The further turnout of events that can lead to influencing the end goal of your teamwork or purpose. Unresolved conflict or disagreement might have a domino effect on the rest of your work. So it may be helpful to reflect with your team about the last several disagreements you had and try to identify the problem. We can learn and grow as a team when we better understand where each other are coming from. And four, learning involves the integrated functioning of the total person, thinking, feeling, perceiving, and behaving. So what does this have to do with SART meetings? 
The multidisciplinary nature of SARTs lends itself well to learning through conflict, differences, and disagreements if they are not avoided and understood as a strength of the group. Although SARTs have an orientation towards action and coordination, there is still a lot of learning that can and should be happening. SART members bring their personal and professional experiences to the work and then further shape those experiences by assimilating the experiences of other SART members, survivors, community members, and stakeholders. This is when the brain is really taking in and reacting to information received through the senses called stimulus. The brain processes stimulus, our experiences, based on an analogy. So for example, how is this experience like what I already know? Over a lifetime of experiential interactions, adults build up associative patterns colored by family, community, society, about who we are as individuals and a group and how our group stands in relation to other groups. This tacit knowledge of our beliefs and assumptions of which we are unaware inform subsequent experiences of every kind. Adult-centered education and processes like facilitation versus lecture create environments where adults can challenge these existing patterns. Taking time to reflect individually on your discipline, your role in the SART and the role of the SART in your community is just as crucial as improving service delivery. It's a part of the cycle of learning. A critical part of effective facilitation that supports learning and growth is encouraging people to step outside of their comfort zone. If we feel completely confident in everything that we're doing and saying all of the time, we're not challenging ourselves to think in new and creative ways about our approach to the work. As Albert Einstein has said, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. Leaving your comfort zone is not about building safety in a group. It's a sign that there is already a sense of safety within the group when participants start leaving their comfort zones more often. So for example, sharing a thought when they don't know how to say it right or responding to a difficult question honestly and for the sake of bringing underlying dynamics to the surface. Discomfort does not mean disapproval or disagreement in this context. It's more connected to feeling unsure, interested, confused, conflicted, challenged. So for example, in the next activity, there may be some statements where you might choose discomfort zone because you have no experience with it in the past and you would need to look to others or existing resources for guidance. What's interesting about this model too is that all of these zones are flexible. They are subject to change depending upon the topic and the situation that we are in. Okay, so I'm gonna read a series of short scenarios and ask you to place yourselves on the spectrum of comfort, discomfort, and alarm zone in your SART coordinator role for each scenario. So again, let's look at the points above. We can define the alarm zone as a place you might go if you're feeling overwhelming shame, traumatic triggers, terrified, disassociated. We can define the comfort zone as uh, an easy autopilot, possibly boring. Um, you can do this without putting much thought or effort into it. Scenario one, you are a relatively new SART coordinator and have come to the meeting fully prepared with a purposeful agenda, including a few topics for discussion. However, when you get to the discussion points, no one contributes, even after you've rephrased the topic and discussion questions a few times. Take a moment and decide what zone would that put you in? Scenario two, recently your team is having all members present about their response to victims and survivors at each meeting. The idea is that this will help everyone understand each other a little bit more and reduce potential conflicts. This month, it is your turn to present about your agency's response. What zone do you find yourself in? Scenario three, you are facilitating a SART meeting focused on mapping out the current response to victims and survivors in your community and different team members are working in small groups on different scenarios. 
One group working on the scenario, victim calls 911 to report a sexual assault, has a disagreement. A deaf community-based advocate disagrees with a law enforcement officer in their group about when the advocate is typically contacted after a victim calls 911. The law enforcement officer is becoming visibly frustrated towards the community-based advocate's ASL interpreter. At this point, what zone do you find yourself in? What did you notice about your responses to the scenarios? I think it's important to recognize that what may put one person in the alarm zone may, may be another person's comfort zone and vice versa. In addition to some of the points we've already made about learning, what is the value of stepping outside your comfort zone? The reason why people like staying in their comfort zones is that they don't even acknowledge the fact that they have stopped thinking about development. Leaving your comfort zone will allow you to become more confident and discover new opportunities that can lead to increased self-actualization, getting more adaptable, and increasing your creativity. One of the most compelling reasons to push outside of your usual boundaries is to stretch your comfort zone. When you take risks, embrace some discomfort and doubt, and succeed, you not only improve your overall skill set, but you boost your confidence. The more you try challenging activities, the more normal those tasks become, broadening your comfort zone to larger and larger dimensions. If anyone was in the alarm zone at any point, what can a facilitator do to bring participants back from that? And if you're the facilitator and you enter the alarm zone, what do you think you can do in the moment to bring yourself back? So if you are the facilitator, I think you know one option is you can call a timeout. You can name this situation and create a discussion at that point. You can provide some redirection or you may want to have a one-on-one -on -one with this individual who is in the alarm zone. Depending on how long your meeting is, this could be a conversation during a break or at lunch, or it might be the following day. But the sooner you can debrief with that person, the better. There might be some lingering thoughts that you'll want to capture. And if you find yourself in the alarm zone, one thing you might try is calling a timeout. There's nothing wrong with allowing a timeout to help gather your thoughts. You can choose to let the conversation play out. This could go a couple of different ways. It could allow you to work through that panic and discomfort by diving deeper into that conversation. If you notice that continuing the conversation is pushing you deeper into the panic or alarm zone though, I would definitely call that timeout. Get that breather that you need and regroup. So in closing, I'd like you to think about two to three takeaways or nuggets of information that you will take away from this presentation today and keep those close by to you as you facilitate your next team meeting. I also wanted to quickly highlight a few resources. The first one, It Impacts Us All, is a facilitator guide. This is a resource that provides an overview of sexual violence and how to support survivors. The second listed on here is um, SART 101. This is a recorded webinar on the Minkasa YouTube channel that provides the basics of SART work, including membership, structure of teams, and process through a framework for systems change. And the last resource listed on here is a framework for success, facilitating sexual assault response teams, which is an additional webinar that covers the basics of SART facilitation through a systems change lens. The next slide includes all of the resources that were specifically referenced within the presentation today. As always, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you for your time today.